Oh, can't you do that all the time? <laughs> it's not as fun. Oh. Welcome to the planning, uh, planning Commission meeting this evening. The date is Monday, July 11th. Will everyone please rise for Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. The next item of the agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. Does anyone have any changes which they'd like to make? If not, I will entertain a motion. Move to approve the agenda. Second. second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Moving on to be the approval of the minutes for the June 27th, 2016 meeting. Does anyone have any changes or any corrections they'd like to make? Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I'd like to uh, request a change to the meetings for the Whitetail Bluff public hearing. Um, there was at one point early in the discussion that um, I had asked staff for a commentary on what would happen if a homeowner buyer uh, would call the city uh, during a due diligence period of vetting his land purchase and ask about the inquiring land uses. And staff gave an excellent answer. Um, I think that ought to be documented here. It wasn't because it was in the context of one of the property owners being promised that there would be uh, trees forever. Uh, and I think there's a conservation area close to the property, but not necessarily this particular parcel. Anyway, staff did an excellent job of identifying what they would say in that instance. And I think that, that uh, due diligence uh, effort by property owners is a valuable uh, lesson. So I thought that should be memorialized in the minutes. So, Julie, can we go back in and look at the tape and then be able to get those minutes in there? Those Mr. Notes? Chair, members of the commission, we can certainly go back and watch the video and include those comments. Great. Okay. So, should we hold the approval of the minutes until that comes back then? Do you have a recommendation on? Mr. Chair, before? I believe that staff is recalls specifically the comment that Commissioner Farr is, is uh, speaking to, and we can certainly incorporate that into the minutes. Okay. So, I think we can move forward. Mm -hmm. Any other changes that anybody would like to make? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll move to approve the minutes. Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay, moving on to public hearings tonight. We have one. It's a code amendment. The request is to amend the city code, chapter 11, section 11.35, to add schools as a, as a permitted use in the public zone district. And I'm assuming, Julie, you'll be taking that on? Mr. Chair, I will. Prior to 2010, the city code included a term public facilities, and that was a permitted use in all zoning districts. That uh, term was a broad definition to include um, any facility owned by a governmental unit and those services related to gas, electric, telephone, etc. In 2010, the city went through a code amendment process where it eliminated the public facilities definition and replaced it with a public infrastructure. So you can imagine prior to 2010, any uh, public buildings such as uh, schools, for instance, were constructed under that umbrella term of a public facility, of course, because it's owned by uh, public um, operations. So when the code was amended to eliminate public facilities and replace it with public infrastructure, which was more narrowly defined just to those specific utility services, schools essentially became a non-conforming use. Staff's recently become aware of this, uh, this unintended consequence, and we've got a two-phase approach in order to rectify that. The first step is to add public schools as a permitted use in the public district. The second uh, piece of that puzzle is to do the outreach to Hennepin Technical College and the local independent school district, which has properties that are guided for public use, but has some properties that are still zoned rural. So staff has had contact with both parties. Both parties at this point um, on a global level are agreeable to that, so we'll be further communicating with, uh, with those parties on that second piece. But the piece before you tonight is just to add schools as they're noted in the staff report as a permitted use to the public district. Okay. Does anyone have any comments or concerns with that? I just got a couple of questions, okay, but please, there's anybody ahead. else? 
Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, when I was reading through the background on this, I uh, noticed a lot of the infrastructure, which I would play, I would say this is infrastructure, um, and as, as you were describing it, what would, for the purposes of the, the public uh, that's viewing, what would this building be zoned? This building currently, meaning city center? Yeah, and other city buildings, because I see that the excluding buildings is right. in your italicized. Right. This this particular site currently is zoned industrial because of what the original use was that was in this building. However, through a PUD process, waivers were granted to allow an increase in office within the industrial district. So the city facilities might be a little bit different, and this proposal this evening doesn't go to fix that issue. At this point, we're looking to fix the school issue, and we will take a look at all of the city facilities as need be. Uh, once we became aware of the schools being a non-conforming use, we certainly wanted to rectify that um, immediately, you know, since it's been some time. So the, the rest of the municipally owned structures and the land that they are built upon, that's phase two or phase three of Correct. correcting Correct. the in inconsistencies in the language. Correct. Okay. Uh, what would the charter, private charter schools, because they provide educational opportunity, but they're not owned by a governmental entity, well, where do private charter schools Charter fall? schools are actually funded um, through the state, so they are publicly okay. uh, funded and would fall within this definition. So they do fall under this, okay? Correct. Yep. Are there any other questions or concerns from the commission? Okay. If not, I'll entertain a motion. Thank you. Is there anyone out in the audience that has any comments or concerns? Not seeing any. I will entertain a motion now. Move to close the public hearing. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Move to recommend approval of the amendment of City Code Chapter 11, Subdivision 11.35 to add schools as a permitted use in the public zoning district and define schools based on the information included in the staff reported dated July 6, 2016. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you very much. Moving on to planners reports tonight. So, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the legislature in May of this past year passed some legislation that would allow for local governments to begin issuing a type of permit for temporary um, temporary housing essentially uh, the term that's being used uh, is that of a granny pod so for instance you can have a senior resident that needs some recuperation in some type of temporary housing structure on your house or your driveway uh, you know, that could be in the form of a modular unit, a recreational vehicle, something of, of that sort. City of Eden Prairie's code requirements certain, or currently do not allow for temporary structures. And unless the city, individual cities opt out of this legislation prior to September 1st, beginning on the 1st of September, the city would be expected to begin issuing permits for this type of, um, this type of temporary dwelling. So the City Council has a public hearing scheduled on this item for its meeting next week and a recommendation from the Planning Commission is necessary prior to the City Council taking any action on code amendments. So staff is recommending that you uh, recommend to the City Council approval of the language that's included in your staff report which basically provides language that says the City would like to opt out of this particular state statute. Any comments from anybody? Commissioners? I'll start. Please. Um, I, I have some uh, moral problems with this. Um, on the surface, I understand the, uh, the requirement maybe to limit our uh, structures on residential properties to fixed dwellings, and I'm all for that, and, uh, and, and we don't want a lot of, uh, I'll call it a visual clutter, maybe was the impetus for this. Uh, in our yards and front yards especially, uh, besides backyards, neighbor problems and all that good stuff. I read the statute, and I don't uh, see the phrase recreational vehicle 
as written in the staff report, allowable. Um, I, I thought I read, uh, I, I read it twice. It, the structure had to be uh, made of the same materials of type, style, and durability as the primary residence or as a residential building. So you're not going to see an airstream in anybody's driveway or a recreational vehicle. Uh, uh, I toured one of these structures at the Minnesota State Fair last August, uh, not knowing this was coming up. And so I know it's a popular trend. Uh, micro homes in general are, are uh, trending uh, for uh, not only a small up and coming families, but our aging population. And uh, my struggle is based on the fact that this was a state statute. They're thinking of our seniors and we're thumbing our noses to a state initiative uh, in Eden Prairie, maybe for the wrong reasons, and, and we don't have another substitute to fill in maybe what's a gap in providing services to our, to our residents. Uh, and, and maybe it's not this detached mobile dwelling that's in the backyard, but to simply say no uh, without anything else uh, as a substitute for it, I, I think we're just thumbing our noses uh, on the initiative. And that, that troubles me. So, so I'd like maybe a dialogue on that. And if somebody knows uh, uh, maybe a little bit more than I about how the state statute came up, I'd be interested to hear that. Um, so I don't have a solution as much as I'm, I'm troubled by the, the fact that we're just saying no. Um, and maybe other suburbs, what are other suburbs doing? And, and uh, I, I fear negative repercussions from the, the press and others saying, why are you thumbing your noses to the needs of our senior citizens? Julie, do you have any comments in regards Mr. to that? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, staff has been in contact with a handful of other communities. I've not yet heard of a community that is opting in to this program whose code does not already allow temporary structures. So th those, that, uh, those municipalities that have a code that don't allow temporary structures to the best of my knowledge, are choosing to opt out. The time frame between when this legislation was passed in, I'm going to say, I believe it was mid-May, um, to its implementation by September 1st. You know, there are other issues that need to be addressed with temporary housing, and that's a pretty tight timeline to build into your code any measures that need to be put in place prior to allowing allowing that our code does not currently allow for temporary housing however in the future should there be a desire uh, to do that it would probably take a fairly comprehensive look at other design issues um, access parking a lot of other issues that would probably need to be addressed along with that and it would probably take a bit of time to do so so I don't necessarily believe that adopting this opt-out means that that's what would be the case forever um, there certainly would be an opportunity at any point if there's a change in policy to go back and uh, revise the code to address those issues yes please. follow up on uh, Commissioner Farr's other question is there any more information that you have or that the city has about the context in which this legislation was discussed at the 2016 session? In other words, where did the interest in doing something of this type come from? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I don't have the, that in-depth detail. Um, I know that our city attorney has been doing a bit of research on that, and we can certainly visit with him to get that additional information to share at, at the council level. Okay. I think that might be helpful. I recall very vaguely that back maybe 20 years ago that similar legislation was considered by the state legislature, and I don't really know the outcome. I know that whatever was fashioned, if it did pass, and I... Again, I don't re recall the information well enough to know that, is that um, the structures had to be very specifically connected, not physically connected, but connected somehow to the property itself in terms of what it was fitting into the area that it was going to be located in. But that's, that, that's probably not helpful because <laughs> the outcome of that and where state law stands on that point now, I don't really know. Thank you. Travis, did you have a question? Uh, to uh, follow up on Commissioner Farr's point, um, I did not see anything about recreational vehicles either. And I pulled up the statute in front of me as well as earlier today I was looking at the bills, both the Senate file and the House file bills, and there was I couldn't find anything that 
in the mind of recreational vehicle, what I consider recreation vehicle, it was constituted that. A lot of it had to do with, had to meet the same type of building standards that regular houses were. It could be mobile, meaning pulled by a one ton or other type of vehicle, um, meet the setbacks and stuff like that. So a lot of the same things that we would see as requests in front of us. Um, however, this is kind of a streamline. It seems like as the state has tried to streamline the opportunity for these interim temporary temporary dwellings before there's a final temporary or final dwelling for, for the senior citizens and they've got a caregiver, everything is in place already. They just need to get something going in the 60 day window that uh, the staff and plus extensions or whatever for a public hearing process would be a little, little difficult in those interim time periods. Plus the fact that it could become costly for our senior uh, community. Uh, I was disturbed on this. Uh, not necessarily uh, for the same reasons, for some of the same reasons, but uh, wondering at which point, I do, at which point do we want the state superseding local government? I believe that the intent is wonderful, but I also think that local government knows what it, within its confines of its border, knows what it's trying to achieve better than the state's just trying to shove something that fits all for everybody. So I like the concept of what they're trying to achieve here. I would just like to see if the staff has used, you know, thought about this concept in the future and trying to figure out a way to implement it in a fast forward motion, or, you know, sooner rather than later, something similar to this without needing the state's overreach. Is, is that something that staff is prepared to maybe have discussions, internal discussions on? Mr. Chair, members of the members of the commission, given the recency of the legislature uh, approving this particular regulation. Staff's not had specific conversations at a uh, far-reaching level about how to address temporary housing. Uh, the concerns that are raised not only are limited to setback issues, but also utility connections, how are, how are water and electricity and the like, sewer connections provided to these temporary units, how do we make sure that's done in um, an appropriate and aesthetically uh, pleasing way and so there are broader issues that would need to be addressed with this temporary housing that um, prior to September 1st is a pretty tight uh, and intensive timeline in order to address some of those concerns. Yeah, I thought it was quite tight as well. They uh, last second on the 12th of May they decided to do this and uh, strangely enough um, I, I didn't look into the history or the actual votes themselves but the Senate from the, their, the legislature's website voted 50 to 15 in favor, so 50 to 15, and then the House was 113 to 17 uh, when it was uh, present, on its presentment date of May 12th. That's just off their website. Um, so it obviously is something that was overwhelmingly in favor of the premise. I think that the one size fits all for state going to local is not necessarily something that I would like to see Eden Prairie go through. I'd like to see Eden Prairie do its due diligence and come up with language in its own code that would be appropriate for this 36 square miles that we have here. So what, uh, commissioners, is the recommendation that we'd like to give to City Council? It almost sounds like you would have to opt out so that we can do our own. Or we just decide to take their boilerplate. Yeah, I would. I would think that. Um, I would think the vote would have been differently if they didn't have this opt-in, opt-out clause. Is my guess. But um, I think that we should have a discussion about it. And it, it's nice to hear some background because I would rather not pass something just because our city code doesn't allow it. It should be a reason to have a discussion. So, is there something where we can do where? We recommend this on to city council. It's going to be well thought out and here. And could city staff report back to us at some point with the next year, a little more comprehensive discussion about it, and then we can look at it at that time. Because I, I do think the timing is pretty quick. Well, well, certainly I can see this kind of thing in our comprehensive guide plan update. You know, we can have these discussions during the comprehensive guide plan update. Julie, what are your thoughts? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, as a part of your recommendation, of course, addressing the issue at hand um, it is important. And if the commission has some additional comments that they'd like to share with the, the council, you know, something along the lines of 
you know, we would recommend that council consider directing staff to look at this issue, or we recommend that, you know, council um, ask for additional information on this issue and report back. Any of those types of recommendations would be within your purview. If I'm hearing correctly, I'm hearing that the commissioners would like a little bit more information. Is that accurate? So I think we go information ahead. and choices potentially. Yeah. Right. Travis what is the timeline on like the timeline? So let's just put it in today's date. Uh, we would opt out. Well, we would recommend to council for opt out, and then they would see this next week. Am I correct on that? Next week. Correct. So the public hearing for this ordinance amendment is scheduled before the city council on July 19th, which is next Tuesday. With any ordinance amendment, there is a need to do a first and a second reading. So council meets July 19th, and then they meet again for a potential second reading on August, I believe it's the 16th. So action on the 19th of July and the 16th of August would allow the city to meet that opt-out timeline prior to September 1st. If the city does not choose to opt out prior to September 1st, then the city will be in the position of um, following the regulations that are laid out in state statute. Uh, the ordinance changes or, or creation of ordinances, does that allow for first and second reading if unanimous vote is, is Ms. held? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I believe it requires a unanimous vote, possibly unanimous attendance. I'm, I'm not 100% sure on whether those two are connected, if it's a unanimous vote of those present or if it requires all council members to be present. So, if all so council I wouldn't members, want to misspeak yeah. on that issue. So the worst case scenario, the best case scenario is all council members are present, it's a unanimous vote for opt out, then we would be able to have another month be able to receive further information, however, the worst case scenario being that it's not unanimous or not everybody is there. Then, then, we, then we need this time, okay. Could I, could I ask a question about hypothesizing how many lots in Eden Prairie, this could even affect, um, let's sweep away the front yard, front driveway parking of this vehicle. Does the most single family lots in Eden Prairie have relatively tight side yard lines? And they probably have a tree in them. So getting this vehicle into the backyard is mostly impractical, I would suggest for most single family lots of an average size. And I didn't read in your narrative whether or not this would affect a multifamily lot or an apartment complex. Does a renter or a condo owner have the same rights as a single family homeowner, if, if that's a nuance of this or not? I don't know. Um, and, and if not, I'm really reading this as a drive front driveway issue because nobody's going to get the this vehicle in their backyard unless they have a five acre lot well I, I don't even know if backyard would be feasible unless there's drive because I remember reading somewhere that it had to be accessible by medical and public uh, public services so fire EMS and police and easily accessible somewhere in there I was trying to find the actual language but yeah I, I don't think the backyard would be very feasible either Commissioner Farr, I was wondering if I could just follow up. I also had the opportunity to tour at the State Fair what was a very elaborate micro. I mean, it was a beautiful you know, micro. My big concern is it's not necessarily the front, uh, a driveway scenario. What it is is the wordage of modular or manufacture. Okay, housing, that's an A to Z. That it, I mean, if we're not talking any codes or anything right here, that could be anywhere from an elaborate fish house, and I'm not being facetious when I say that, because some of them can be quite elaborate, or it could be, you know, hey, drop the wheels, you know, as far as right in my, your backyard. So I think it goes beyond the front yard. I'm, uh, I look at, you know, without a lot of tightness onto that, that you're dealing with almost an A to Z type of scenario. And many times in that type of scenario, I think it, it you got to look at it. Sure. Um, so I mean, that's just my opinion on that one. 
But I do remember that. I do remember the tour, and that is a trend. Um, I think, I believe that was a, a vacation home uh, as far as like they were at the state fair. Uh, so they can get elaborate, but I wonder how many would be, seriously. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, some additional concerns that were shared at a staff level also focused around the language that talked about the needs of the particular individual that would be using um, using the temporary housing. Um, the language is at best a bit vague in uh, allowing st the city staff or the city to make the determination about um, when that extension can be allowed for six months. Um, it also is not necessarily very uh, definitive language about what constitutes those types of needs. Um, so there's concern at a staff level as well that staff would be in a position if temporary permits were to be issued for the, this, this type of housing as to how much uh, information the city would need in order to make strong recommendations and um, well thought out conditions if so necessary on those permits. So just to shed some light on your concern, uh, subdivision two of the statute, I'll just read it off, rattle it off fast here for, for everybody's listening pleasure. Uh, temporary family health care dwelling must, uh, these are the requirements for the dwelling itself, uh, primarily assemble at a location other than the site of installation, no more than 300 gross square feet, not be attached to permanent foundation, universally designed and meet state recognized accessibility standards, uh, provide access to water and electric by either connecting or connecting the utilities that, that are serving the principal dwelling or by other comparable means, have exterior materials that are compatible in composition, appearance, and durability to the exterior materials used in standard residential construction. Uh, minimum R15 installation factor, installed, removed, and transported by one ton truck as defined in other statutes or a truck tractor as defined in other statutes. Uh, be built under Minnesota rules, uh, chapters 1360 and 1361, and contain ANSI code 119, and then be equipped with backflow check valve obviously for water, keeping the water uh, or water table safe. So there you go, 300 square feet max. <laughs> that's not big. Some key phrases that you pointed out there about the pre-manufactured type and they had to meet the accessibility standards. So we're talking about a, a product that is specifically manufactured for this intended use, mm -hmm. as opposed to someone modifying a fish house, a camper, or something like that. That, that falls off the radar screen. These are, these are actual products that are on the market now that look like houses, they're built like houses, they're small, they're mobile, and they're intended for this function. Mm -hmm. Good. So we need to help you figure out a recommendation, don't we, Mr. Chairman? You. <laughs> More importantly, you need to help Julie give a recommendation. <laughs> I feel like I, oh. I have language, but I do support uh, opting out. I don't think the city is prepared to move forward now. Uh, I wasn't deeply involved in this at the legislature, but they didn't spend enough time with it either. And I think there was a lot of concern from many cities. And I think the vote count, I think you're absolutely right. The vote count was the way it was for a number of reasons. However, one of them most significantly was the opt-out provision. That legislation would not have passed without it. Um, I, you know, I think there's, I guess my question would be, it, is there a need? Have you heard there is a need here in Eden Prairie? Has there been a request to do this? Uh, and are we working against something there? It's a pretty tight time frame for this piece, uh, but I do think if there is a need and a desire for some to have this in the city, it's something we should look at in the future as to how to do it and do it right. But I think some of the model for this was done in other states that are warmer climate. So I think the practical concerns are significant. Water, sewer, uh, you know, it, not just the aesthetic piece, but just the practical piece of having this in the winter in Minnesota. And I think a lot of those pieces just haven't been worked through because we haven't had it here. Uh, so I would support uh, opting out. But I think my question to you, Julie, or to, to other staff is, have you heard a, a need or had a request 
to look at this? Mr. Chair, members of the commission, of course, this prompted some conversation at a staff level. So planning staff as well at, has touched base with the building department staff as well. And to the best of my knowledge, through those conversations with both staff and planning and in the building division is that the city of Eden Prairie has not received any requests for this type of housing at this point. So I would urge as one of maybe a number of recommendations to council um, to have council establish a, uh, a position statement that they are not anti-temporary senior housing or people that have compromised health or wellness issues because I think that political issue could just backfire on us as being arrogant or something. And I don't think that's anybody's intent, um, but but that could be misconstrued. So I think that they, they ought to establish a position statement about the the uh, live, work, play Eden Prairie, and and we're here to support people of all ages in our community um, in a responsible way, in consistent with the ordinance. And and by saying opt out tonight, that's consistent with our ordinance. But but the message from the state is that we ought to be more concerned than what we are now. And I'm, and we're doing this. We're, we're. I guess I would just add that, um, I don't know if I agree with that. I just don't know if I'd make that a recommendation to city council a position statement. Why wouldn't we just adopt something like that if that's what our, our thoughts are on it? Sure, well, sure. We would not be likely to bring that together this evening. That's my concern. Right. Well, I think it's and, we, right. and we're on a tight time. Yeah. I mean, part of it already is in public record. Yeah. I mean, just having the conversation tonight is part of yes. public record. Exactly. Which I think is fine. Um, so let me ask a question. Is everyone okay with the opt out approach? Mm. Yes. So, Julie, we've gotten that far. Okay. Uh, sorry, I was taking notes. I didn't see That's okay. So, we, so uh, the commission agrees on the, uh, as an entity, about opting out. Okay. And I think the rest of the conversation is, like Commissioner Farr was saying, you know, we don't want to disclude senior citizens in any way. That's not our attempt in order to do this. Um, I think we would like to hear uh, additional information from the state and from the city um, about what other options are out there. So we have uh, maybe a deeper conversation later. Fair enough. Mr. Chair, members of the commission, certainly in the report that moves forward to the city council, staff can reflect your conversation. And of course, the minutes um, are forwarded to them as well. Okay. Does anyone have any concerns before we move on? I don't have a concern. I just have a comment on that. I like the Please. way that you articulated that um, language that is at the state level. A lot of times can get convoluted and, and generalized and uh, changing that is a a big hurdle. However, if we create our own language that is of similar intent and similar premise, we can modify that to the marketplace a lot easier and, and quicker than the the one size fits all right. state yeah. statute. So yeah. I, I think, I mean, this is the boilerplate. Here's our flagship language. Let's modify it to our to our suiting. Okay, fair enough, Julie. You have enough information to go back to the city council? Mr. Yes, I do, Mr. Chair, but I would like a motion and a vote on the recommendation. Okay. Can I have a motion on the floor, please? I'll make a motion. Move to recommend to the city council that the city council approve an amendment to the city code to opt out of the temporary dwelling legislation of Minnesota statute section 462.3593 based on the information included in the staff report dated July 6, 2016. Travis, go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll second that. Do we want to add in and the discussions that do we need to formally add in the discussions or just in the notes that you've been taking? Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the commission, I can certainly include that information about the discussion here this evening in the report back to the city council. So along with the motion would be the additional notes that uh, city staff has taken tonight be fed back to the city council Yep. for discussion. Fair yep. enough? Yep. Okay. Fair enough. So there's the motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 aye.
Any opposed? Okay. Excellent. Thanks, everyone. Since I'm the senior member on the commission. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any other plant more planners reports for tonight? <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the commission, the planning commission meeting for July 25th will be canceled. Okay. Oh. Very good. Thank you. Okay, good. Get out on those lakes, everybody. Yeah. Great. Great. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Moving on. Any members reports for tonight? Yes, sir. I, uh, I think I was going to put this under new business, but I think I might just put it under members report. Okay. Um, I have heard from the residential community of various uh, individuals of the residential and of the business community uh, questions and I liaised with staff earlier about this um, questions regarding the uh, park improvements at Round Lake and uh, what's going on and you know the, the ball fields they were there one day on 4th of July and now they're not I, I and I told them that I would approach that subject uh, on this meeting tonight um, Unfortunately, the individual that I think would be the well versed in that is uh, in membership with his Parks and Recreational Commission meeting tonight because of the fourth that was bumped to this week. And so I think um, if if you have anything to say other, uh, on the subject, otherwise I think maybe those that are tuning in um, stay tuned till August. <laughs> <laughs> right. Perhaps something will be in a newspaper or. On the website, you can always go to the website as well. But um, is Mr. Is Mr. Bourne uh, familiar with the the context in which you're talking about? I had a conversation with him today about the very subject and uh, over the phone, and I'm not going to put try to regurgitate right. verbatim what he's st he stated. So I'll let him. Uh, he did say that he's and, and staff have been. Uh, taking questions and giving comments to, to, to those or giving answers to those that have addressed okay. and issues to it. So they're doing a, a very good job there on, on that. Uh, so okay. fair enough. Any other members reports? Any continuing business for tonight? Any new business? If not, I'll entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. A motion second. All in favor say aye. 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 Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. That's what I heard, but I didn't want